you know, I learned the platforms, had a C5, a C6, two C7s, you know, that type of thing. And just going through and learning the challenges, the differences in tuning, that's kind of how that happened. It, it seemed to me the best bang for the buck. You know, there's a lightweight car, has good power, rear wheel drive, you know, a little rough around the edges. Yeah, that's, that's me. Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by Jeremy from Faster Proms. Jeremy runs both a very well-established and well-followed YouTube channel, as well as his business that is involved in modifying and tuning cars. His YouTube channel has covered some pretty insane builds, such as shoehorning a Turbo K-Series engine into the back of a smart car. And I'm not sure that any smart car really needs 500 plus plus horsepower, but I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun trying to put that to the ground. In this interview, we dive deep into the world of GM reflashing. This is one of the most cost-effective ways of modifying the calibration on late-model GM vehicles. The amount of power we've got when it comes to reflashing the factory engine control module in these GM vehicles is astonishing, and there's not really a lot we can't do. We dive deep into that topic with Jeremy, talk about the pros and cons, why there are advantages with retaining the factory ECU, and when we should be considering maybe switching to a full aftermarket standalone. We also cover some of the intricacies that go into GM reflashing, specifically here on the HP Tuners platform, although everything we talk about will transition across to other platforms as well. Another interesting topic that we cover with Jeremy is the different ways we can go about tuning. Obviously everyone associates tuning with a dyno, but that is definitely not the only way, and there can be pros as well as of course cons to actually performing your tuning out on the road. There's also an upcoming industry that's involved with e-tunes where the tuner actually never sees the car and all of the tuning is done remotely via email with files and data logs. So we talk about what we need to know with those different techniques and where the pros and cons lie with each. Before we get into our interview with Jeremy, for those who are new to High Performance Academy and the Tune In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialize in teaching people how to tune EFI, how to build performance engines, how to design design and build wiring harnesses. We also cover topics such as 3D CAD design and modeling, race driver education, race car setup, suspension optimization, data analysis and even fabrication. You can find a full list of our courses at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. All of our courses are delivered via high definition video modules that you can watch from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection. And as a listener of this podcast, you can use the coupon code PODCAST75. That'll get you 75 bucks off the purchase of your very first HPA course. We'll put that coupon code and a link to our courses page in the show notes. All right, enough with our introduction. Let's get into our chat now. All right, welcome to the podcast. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. And as we always do, let's get started by finding out a little bit about your background, specifically how you got interested in the automotive scene. Okay, well, actually... Uh this starts with my dad. This goes way, way back to the 1985. All right. So my dad was really fascinated with, he's always been like a, a gearhead, had really fast stuff. His previous project before that had like a NASCAR cylinder heads on a, in a 56 Corvette with a 414 Milladon and like a 400 shot of nitrous. So it was like a thousand wheel horsepower or 56 Corvette. And so he was like, oh, this fuel injection is pretty cool. So this TPI thing they got going on with the Corvettes in 1985, he's like, oh, I'm going to, to try that out. So I remember being very young and I was three years old at the time, went and he got a 82 S10 and proceeded to get a wrecked C4 uh, Corvette 85 TPI and stick it in the S10 in 1985. The truck actually went slower with the 350. <laughs> so he was like, what the hell? And then that, that started this whole thing. He started getting in, in touch with people from Michigan. He got books, he got data logging, and the, the, how crude these boxes for data logging were way back in the day was incredible. It was cutting edge at the time in the 80s, so he eventually got it faster and faster and faster, and then he got a, an 87 vet and made that faster and faster, and that eventually 
I still actually own it. It looks like a 96, but uh, that's a really popular thing on our YouTube channel with my dad's bet and kind of the kick back and forth and trying to tweak that into a little bit more later model engine management. But anyway, in the 90s, he got it to run 10s, naturally aspirated, no nitrous. It was the fastest naturally aspirated bet in the world for a while. Uh, of course, things are loads faster, but at the time, for what it was, I mean, we beat John Lingenfelter, we beat John Hennessy at uh, the Bet Viper shootouts. It was a Bet Viper shootout winner, and it was just my dad and one other guy that built the car. You know, they just built it in a garage, and he pieced everything together. Really did a, a fantastic job, and it was really a underdog, you know, David versus Goliath. Yeah. Let's just dive uh, back into that. I mean, obviously, just from what you've said there, you kind of were predisposed to this life. And I don't know if you really maybe had too many options, call it genetics or upbringing, you know, that combination kind of really didn't give you too many other directions to go in. But I'm interested because it sounds like your dad was a fairly early adopter of EFI. And admittedly, as you've sort of alluded to there, the technology of EFI back in those days was nowhere near what it is now, particularly if we're talking throttle body injection versus multi-point, the, the some limitations in and of itself right there. Can you remember back to when your dad converted to an EFI platform what it was that was holding him back, why why the car actually went slower initially? I mean, it could have been math placement. It could have been it could have been a slew of things. It's kind of like the more you know, the more you know you don't know. You know, I mean, he could have had oxygen sensors goofed up, boogered up. He could have had fuel pressure wrong. I don't know exactly what was the prime culprit for that. All I do know is that he figured it out with those crude tools back in the day. And I mean, heck. I think it's easy to do vacuum leaks with that. I mean, if you got a PCV port that's post math and then you hook it up wrong, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of different scenarios that you could, and, you know, those are rabbit holes itself. I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing. I, I don't know, you know, him obviously figuring out the spark advance and the fuel mapping and stuff. I mean, they didn't have wide bands really back then. So yeah, it was, it was unfortunately much simpler times. I mean, I still came into the tuning scene quite a bit later than that but I mean even when I got stuck in, and, and got involved wideband if your ratio meters were in the thousands of dollars and I'm talking probably three to five thousand US dollars not the sort of few hundred dollars we can pick them up for now so you know they were rare dynos were almost non-existent so the understanding and knowledge in the tuning industry back when I got started was very very limited and I imagine it sounds like your dad probably similar scenario and kind of paving the way and figuring it all out for himself. In terms of your upbringing, then you're, you're obviously by the sounds of it sort of raised sort of spinning spanners on cars. What's your sort of earliest memories of sort of learning these skills and developing them? Well, honestly, I mean, I think, you know, in hindsight, I didn't appreciate it for what it was. Uh, I mean, my father passed away when I was 18. And what do you really know when you're 18? Not not what you think you know. <laughs> you know, so I was, you know, probably up until maybe 16, I didn't even really appreciate it very much. And I mean, it was cool to say, oh, hey, my dad's got a really fast bed. And, yeah, we won some stuff and whatever. Uh, but again, I didn't really fully understand how important really the weight behind it, I guess, you know, it was a, it was a big deal back then. But Again, way after he died, I mean, I still have people that'll come up to me and be like, my gosh, man, your dad was like an amazing tuner back then. I had a car, you know, I had an 80s Corvette and he did a tune for me, blah, blah, blah. You know and I mean? That's, that still happens, which is really cool. And it's like, it's neat that my kids kind of get to see sort of that whenever it happens to me, you know, if people come up and be like, man, do you know your dad? You know, things like that. So it's cool. And, uh, <laughs> I certainly tried to watch my health more than my father watched his. So I learned from, but nonetheless, after my dad passed, I had tremendous assets that I really was like, I, I should take advantage of this. I mean, I have the infrastructure to do this, even though I didn't have the understanding. So at 18 years old, I'm sitting there learning how to tune on a TPI car and using some basic stuff. I mean, heck, I used, you know, that was 2000 when that was out. So yeah, right out of high school, my dad had passed and I, was learning to tune on Tuner Cat back in you know 2000, <laughs> cutting EPROMs and stuff like that. And it was brutal tough. So my father used to think in hexadecimal and binary, and I I can't do that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, it's like... It, no, I don't think anyone wants to do that. Why would you want to do that? You know, you got to be a glutton for punishment to think in, you know, that. So I remember him, 
you know, doing calculations on fuel mapping and gallons per hour flowing and all this other stuff, changing injectors and stuff. And I was just like, man, I don't want to have any part of that. You know, I don't even know that he did it right, you know, back then because, but it's just, it's just crazy. But, uh, I actually came into the tuning industry probably sort of on that crossover. I was probably quite lucky with the timing and so much as the removable EPROMs were still around and there definitely were people tuning them here in New Zealand specifically anyway. But the standalones, the plug and plays and sort of some of the early reflashing solutions that you know, didn't require you to physically remove an EPROM from a board those were sort of my bread and butter and once I sort of started my business and and started building a bit of a name for myself it, you know occasionally you get an inquiry like hey can you you tune such and such a ECU that required a, an EPROM being removed well, I was just hard no absolutely not you know, if, at, at the point I was you know the technology had clearly moved on this was going to be a dying and diminishing industry of burning prom, e-proms so I kind of decided to distance myself from that which which worked out fine but I guess it all comes down to exactly what era you got involved. Yeah. All right so in terms of coming out of high school it sounds like most of your knowledge and skill set at this point had sort of been built up and passed on from from your dad. Are there any sort of formal qualifications that you had sort of taken towards an automotive career or did it sort of the school's essentially self-taught. It, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a blend. Basically, from high school, I was like, you know, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to do this thing for a couple of years and learn business and this and that, and whatever. And I mean, like, it came to a point where I was getting so much demand for tuning. I was just like, you know what? I need to, this is a path that I don't want to go down. And I think it's a rat race in its own way. And I just, you know, I'm not a conventional guy like that. I'm a big, you know, the more I think about it, the more I'm like a trade school type person, you know, and the fact that like, Yes, you can go down this path. It's like part of the club and, you know, whatever. Or it's like you can actually learn the trade that you want to do, cut off all the BS, cut out the debt and go straight to it. And if you have the drive, you can be successful, you know, and if you treat people right over time, people will take notice and you'll have business. And I think that's just, you know, I treat people the way I want to be treated. Certainly there's mistakes made, you know, I'm only human, but uh, at the same time, it's like, I think that that works and people gravitate towards that. So, Yeah, I, th- I think, unfortunately, and this is one of the reasons we actually started High Performance Academy, I ran and owned a performance workshop for 13 years, and I saw the good, the bad, and unfortunately the ugly. And the whole industry has such a, a bad reputation, I would say, in general. And that's not taking away from the operators out there who are doing exceptional work and looking after their customers, charging fair money for a good quality product. But unfortunately, I think maybe it's changing a little bit, but those sort of good operators still fall into the minority. So I kind of got really frustrated with with customers rocking up to my door and they hadn't even got the car into the workshop and they already sort of looked like they were going to end up with a blown engine or getting ripped off. And it was really frustrating for me because we classed ourselves as one of the good operators. And I think that lack of knowledge and training out there in the industry, anyone, I guess, with enough money for a dyno or these days even to do street tuning or e-tuning, which we'll talk about as we go, can kind of open their doors and start taking money off customers tomorrow. And that doesn't necessarily mean they've got the runs on the board to actually turn out quality work. So it's a bit of a minefield out there, I think, of finding good operators. And if you can be a good operator, I found at least that sort of marketed your business business for you because it's a small industry, relatively speaking, particularly here in New Zealand, there's only four and a half million people here. So if you're turning out shoddy work and ripping off customers, the word is going to spread very quickly. And the complete opposite, of course, you know, if you're turning out quality work at a fair price, you're going to get more customers rocking up to your door. So I, I think that's that's just business 101, at least as far as I'm concerned. For sure, for sure. But more to answer, I didn't fully answer your question, but I mean, what I was also saying, hey, I had a tremendous amount of assets. A lot of those assets were people and people that are good people, you know, people that would stop what they're doing and help you if you're in the middle of a, a jam, you know, so... I had a lot of, you know, my father's friends, acquaintances that would help the the resources that he had as in connections, but yeah, people that could help me get through and navigate through that, especially as a young guy, not knowing very much. Yeah. I mean, those were 
people that help shape me. So it's like I just my values and, and who I am helped shape the ethics part of it. And then, you know, my drive helped that. But other people's knowledge and experience and showing me certain, you know, means of, hey, this works after that type of thing. Again, I became a little eclectic and a little melting pot in myself. And we all do because that's how we all are, you know. But but yeah, that's that's basically what shaped me. I had, I'm interested just my experience, and this probably, I'm guilty of this myself, but 18, you kind of, young and dumb, full of enthusiasm, you think you know everything. So it'd be very tempting, I'd imagine, for most 18-year-olds to go, hey, you know what, I don't need all of the support network and all of these old boys who have got these old school ideas and grew up on carburetors. I, I know what I need to know and just sort of forge your own path ignoring this advice and it sounds like you've done the polar opposite and actually surrounded yourself with these mentors yeah i was never too i was always looking for wisdom and realizing you know and that still holds true today this is weird so there's a group of guys that have ssrs and i think the average owner's age is like 72 years old or something like that you know it might be up there might be 64 or something but it's like everybody's like i don't want to tune those those are stupid and they're a bunch of old farts and whatever and it's like but i will tell you there's some of the most enjoyable people to have conversations with. And I've had just some of the coolest conversations with some of these old guys and the knowledge and the wisdom that they're willing to impart is so worth it. I mean, I've had guys that have shot out of planes and shot out of helicopters and partially paralyzed. I mean, just you name it, just the coolest stuff. I mean, and it's just been such a cool ride with, with that. So yeah, I think you can always you know learn more from older people. And I mean, they are the best resource, you know. So. Yeah. I think it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that an engine fundamentally hasn't really changed over the decades. I mean, yes, we've seen more modern technology applied to them. We've moved from carburation to fuel injection. But the basics of, of how the engine operates really are still the same. So that technical knowledge, that background that these older gentlemen have and are prepared to pass on still 100% relevant let's move into your your business so for faster problems that's your sort of mechanical slash tuning slash modification business sort of fill in the gaps between coming out of high school 18 years of age losing your father and then the foundation of faster problems is this a business that you kind of inherited and grew from your dad or is this a completely different entity it technically wasn't named when he was running it. Like he was basically doing that from 80, like six, you know, for other people all the way up until 2000 when it died. And then from 2000 on, we had, um, it was my mom that came up with the name. Basically fast chips was taken, you know, somebody else, a guy out in Tulsa, Oklahoma had that. And, uh, I don't know if he's still in business or not, but, uh, yeah, we had, uh, so prom was synonymous with chip as programmable read on memory. So yeah, fast proms was a very weird name, but at the same time, yeah, that's, that basically was the easy go-to uh, at the time. The, the business has evolved. I mean, it was my mom and my mom, my mom helped do the coding and all that type of thing way back in the day. And basically 2006, I got married and basically before that I had fully already taken over the business was doing dyno tuning way before that and all that but moved the business a couple different times and all that i mean i had a five bay garage in the back of my house the air conditioning in florida and i mean that's a must but it was pretty awesome the stuff that we were cranking out in my in my workshop out back you know it was, it was pretty awesome and then eventually that got too big and the neighbors got pissed <laughs> and so just had to shop over here in Clearwater and you know it's a little ways away but that's pretty awesome I mean it was a blessing in disguise in a way and yeah I mean we got a pretty cool shop I mean we're doing late model stuff it's really cool and and to touch on your point that you said hey engines haven't changed too much and I mean I agree and one of the things that uh Smokey Unix said that holds fast right now is, is like look the biggest thing that's changed is just the engine's ability to fill the cylinder at a higher and higher and higher RPM and I mean, you could see that with all sorts of competitive motorsports and from what the small block, for example, was in the 50s all the way up until now. I mean, now we have a 9,000 plus RPM revving V8s that are streetcars that you can go and buy. I mean, that was unheard of. Yeah. What a time to be alive. 
Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> okay. In terms of the business, maybe just you've given us a, a little bit of insight, but give us a sort of 30,000 foot view of, of what it is today in terms of, of size. I think you've already mentioned location, but uh, number of staff. And, and then if we can get into you know the sort of services that you're offering. Sure. Well, we've got uh, two full-time guys, that's Laz and Juan, and then we've got a couple guys that help out part-time here and there that are you know, certain skill sets, some fabricators, some guys are engineers, some guys are, you know, some guys can go and get parts. Like sometimes my son goes and he's like a grunt, you know, so that that's cool. But yeah, most things that have to do with airflow and we touch. So, I mean, for example, if you have a 2017 Z06 and you bring it in, you're like, Hey, I got a stock car and I want to want to make a bunch more power. I mean, great. You got a fantastic power plant. You can walk in and walk out and basically a day's time if we have it with 120 wheel horsepower or more and headers cold air ported the blower flex fuel kit and tuned it and the car is just immensely more powerful we have keep parts in stock for a lot of late model gms we're mainly just late, late model gm yes we do hollies a bit and those are those are pretty awesome if there's a standalone that's typically my go-to as a holly i'm a big quick turnover, high profit type guy. I mean, certainly there's other things that I would have liked to dive into. Like my son's got a Subaru and I'd love to dive down that rabbit hole. I don't really want to. It's like I, I have somebody else that would, that can navigate through it and I'll just put my input in there, you know, so that's pretty cool. Let's just stop there and we'll just talk a little bit about that because I know we've got a, a sort of a, a wide range of, of listeners and some either own workshops or are looking to go down that path. So I always like to get a little bit of business insight and it sounds like what you've just kind of glossed over there is very similar to, to my own experience with my shop in terms of it's so important to really think long and hard about the type of work that you want to be doing and also the models of vehicle that you want to support. So on that note, for a start, could you tell us how it sort of came to be that late model GM was your weapon of choice? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Well, my father was always, you know, Corvette guy. And then I kind of became a Corvette guy. It seemed like, again, because of the infrastructure, basically because of, again, assets and resources and stuff like that. So, you know, I learned the platforms, had a C4, a C5, a C6, two C7s, you know, that type of thing. And just going through and learning the challenges, the differences in, in tuning, that's kind of how that happened it, it seemed to me the best bang for the buck you know just to there's a lightweight car has good power rear wheel drive you know a little rough around the edges yeah that's that's me you know so it's like the mustang has always been cool and mustangs are faster than ever i gotta give kudos to them and i mean it's so cool to see dodge doing what they're doing and they're screw everybody you know we're gonna put a freaking hemi in the shopping cart and you know whatever so. I, I guess you're spoiled for choice these days realistically in terms of focusing your energies, though, on one model, does that sort of give you economies of scale in terms of, you know, you know that thing inside and out, you can build up package upgrades, you know how to fit the parts, you know exactly what they're going to deliver, speeds up the dyno time because you've already got kind of calibrations from a hundred previous vehicles of the same trim that you can lean on. Am I sort of picking that up right? No, you're absolutely right. Like, for example, right now, I mean, yeah, you're dead on. I mean, we've got a late model truck in the shop that's getting a cam. And yeah, it's very similar to the late model Camaro getting a cam, you know, or, or late model Corvette or whatever. So yeah, it's very, very similar. A lot of that stuff, you know, it all bolts together the same way. So it's, I think in other words, chasing all of the things that I would want to do rather than, and I'm not saying don't chase those things, you know, but I mean, it's been my experience that if I focus on what I know and what I'm comfortable with and what I realize can be more profitable than the stuff that I think would be super cool. Like, yeah, it would be super cool to build twin turbo Lamborghinis or it'd be super cool to like do all wheel drive Hondas with sequential gearboxes and street cars, eight second street cars. That'd be great. But it's, it's not my thing, but it's like, uh, it's cool and I respect it. Absolutely. I can appreciate super efficient engineering and can appreciate super efficient fast street cars that's just my thing is fast street cars if i sort of look back on my progression through my old business i think exactly what you're saying kind of became clear 
I mean, here in New Zealand, we're lucky that we have access to a lot of Japanese domestic market vehicles. So that, that was kind of our bread and butter. And, and I was involved in the Evo drag racing world. So we set some world records and that meant that people brought us Evos and Subarus, which was absolutely fine. And what we sort of found over the time was that more often than not, and this is no disrespect to the younger enthusiasts listening who are, are getting started, we all start somewhere, but essentially the theme was a common one of guy or girl basically ticks up a car that they can barely afford and then can't really afford to maintain it because all their money's been spent on buying the car in the first place. So you'd get a car in the workshop for a tune and you'd booked it in sight unseen for a tune, so it's got a slot on the dyno and, and that's that. And it rolls in the door and straight away one look and you're like, yeah, well, this thing needs eight hours of workshop labor before it even looks at the dyno. You know, it's held together with hopes, dreams and a bit of race tape. And that was, you know, frustrating because A, I couldn't deliver the product that I knew that I wanted for the customer. B, the customer generally, they'd saved up or borrowed or whatever for the cost of the dyno tune alone. So when you hit them with like, hey, you need to fix this, this and this, it's going to be another three, four, eight hundred dollars whatever, that, that was out of the budget, so that was a problem. And then it also just interrupted our workflow. And what I sort of found with that is, you know, if you look at the franchise dealership style mechanical business model, it's a case of car comes in for a cam belt maybe a cam chain these days, but let's call it a cam belt. And that's got a book time of four hours. So that's what the customer gets charged. Good mechanic who's done those, you know, a hundred times in the, the last year will probably knock that out of the park in, in 45 minutes to an hour. So the shop makes three hours of cream on that one job. And what I found with the aftermarket performance industry where you're dealing with these sorts of cars that maybe aren't in pristine condition, you'd sort of quote a job that was three hours, find a bunch of other stuff along the way. So the job that you quoted three hours for takes six, you can't charge six, you actually can't kind of go backwards. So we, we transitioned into that late model GM world as well. And it was just a revelation. I think one of the, the biggest advantages, and I'm, I'm sure this goes for you as well with the, the Corvette models, is you're dealing with a much more expensive base car that kind of puts you into a different market of consumer. You've got a slightly older consumer that's got that car, they've got a bit more of a disposable income. Things aren't so tight when issues arise. Has that sort of been your experience too? 100%, 100%. And I mean, that is who you're marketing to weeded out some of that. So yes, as cars have gotten cheaper and you know the C5 had a long run, I mean, now we've got, you know, I mean, heck, I've had 18 year old kids with a C5, but the 18 year old kid could also have a, you know, a 2019, you know, or something. So it's just, it's all over the place. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. You're, you hit the nail on the head for sure. I, I think for me, at least, and this will probably go for a, a lot of the automotive businesses in the aftermarket industry, it sort of, there was a shift because I got into it really, all I cared about was making my Evo faster. I just wanted to be the fastest. So it was everything was just a means to an end. I was paying myself probably below minimum wage and I didn't care because I, I needed a new turbo or a new set of cams or whatever, whatever it was. And then that was fine for a few years, but as you get a little bit older and you know, start considering having a family, all of a sudden like a hobby business like that, for me at least, just didn't make sense. And you actually start to have to look around and pivot and go, hey, does, does this business model that I'm using still make sense for me? And it didn't. So I had to look at what I could change to provide the results that I wanted to be able to provide get the customers that could sort of work with us and make the business actually a viable and profitable business. And it took a little bit of time, but I think that's a learning curve that a lot of people go through when they start what is generally a hobby business because they enjoy something or they're good at it. And then you sort of like realize, oh, actually, shit, there's a lot more that goes into business than just being good at tuning, for example. Yeah, we picked up little things all along the way that helped that. But I mean, yeah, you sound very much like cut from the same cloth. As far as uh, I wanted to be the fastest and I wanted to you know, support my addiction in a way, you know, so. And there's nothing wrong with that for a while. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, I mean, heck, dude, there was years that I would go to like Corvette shows and I'd have like a, a bag of mods that I could do really quick and I'm short on the spot, you know, like a short throw shifter that I cut down in my, 
ported throttle bodies and stuff. I mean, those things are what, in, in a way, it's humbling, humble beginnings, but it's like it's what helps pay the bills. And, you know, without those things, it would be a different outcome. You know, I mean, some of those things have bought other vehicles or could even bought this house. You know, who knows? I don't know if they're all part of the scheme. So Absolutely. Interested if there's anything that you could list as maybe a, a key hurdle or obstacle that you've had to face and overcome during your operation of business up to this point? Maybe there isn't. Maybe it's all been plain sailing. No, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's a pretty cutthroat business. I ethically don't want to be that way. You know, maybe I have been. There's certainly enough room in all of the business for enough people to make money and and again i think your output is going to speak for itself so i mean there's been many times where i've had customers that have either turned into competitors and ultimately that came from either an experience or a tune from me and uh yeah i mean there's a slew of but that's that's fine some of those guys have come and gone some of those guys are still doing what they're doing and that's fine i don't have any animosity about that i mean some of it's setbacks because it's like you might struggle for years in order to get some sort of cutting edge or do some sort of thing that would give you a major advantage over somebody. And it's like, yes, I sold that to you for basically a $600 dyno tune at the time or whatever. And now you took that information, you know it. Now you can go ahead and blab it from the rooftops, you know, whatever, you know. But that's one thing that comes to mind, but that's really, that's really about it. I mean, there's falling outs of relationships and stuff like that. I mean, stuff happens, man. You know, it's like try and do the best you can and you can't make everybody happy. But I mean, I think on that note, as long as you can sleep at night knowing that you've done the best that you possibly can, exactly as you say, unfortunately, the best tuner in the world will still have customers that feel that you've wronged them it's just it's an inevitable fact unfortunately you sort of can go from hero to zero very very quickly and uh, more often than not for something that's completely out of your control so i think i learned pretty early on that if you want to perform on this stage then you do have to build a a reasonably thick skin otherwise uh, you're going to struggle particularly if you're going to put yourself out there on youtube as well which is a a nice segue into your YouTube channel. So yeah, tell me about that, particularly in terms of the business and the YouTube channel. Obviously, there's a synergy there between them, but which came first? Uh, I mean, well, certainly the business. I was only doing YouTube for a little while. I mean, I had certainly some some help from Cletus. I wouldn't have been where I was at without the help or the boost from him and the fact that we shared a shop for a little while. So that was cool. Those were good times. Things have changed since then. But yeah, I mean... I think I found, you know, YouTube is a, a tough beast to feed. Uh, you can put a lot of stuff out there. What's different about YouTube and from any, you know, and I try and explain this to people that are blue collar or it doesn't matter, white collar. You do a job and you do a darn good job. You do what's asked of you and you put it out there and you expect to be paid. Well, YouTube doesn't work that way, folks. <laughs> it's like you can do the best work of your life and leave it all on the table and get nothing for it. So yeah, and and that aspect, YouTube sucks for that. But it's like, it is also a risk. I mean, you've made a production and, you know, so I'm I'm realistic about it. You know, it's like if and when I go back to YouTube, I'm not going to do it as a, you know, I'm not going to expect to make good money doing it. I mean, YouTube can be a very good, viable source of income, but it's very demanding. And they have all sorts of algorithms in the background that are like, okay, this guy that posts four or five times a week is going to get precedence over the guy that doesn't, you know, the guy that's posted, you know, once a month or something like that. So there, there's stuff like that. And what you do and say in YouTube is, uh, is also looked at, judged and, and put into basically like a, almost like a social credit score. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a frustration we have for those who aren't already following us uh, a youtube channel through high performance academy so i've been i've been exposed to this firsthand and having a couple of young kids it's, it's always frustrating when at hpa we pour a week of effort into producing a, what we consider to be a really good technically detailed and accurate video with a lot of b-roll that's engaging and interesting and we put that up and um, i mean maybe if it's a good one 
maybe it gets sort of 50,000 views, maybe 100,000. We've had a few oddities that sort of knock it out of the park for reasons we can't really figure out. And then I sort of stumble into my son's room and he's watching someone unboxing uh, kids' toys on on YouTube and and they've got like 6 million views and you're like, what is going on here? It just, uh, that's sort of frustrating, but you know, that's the world we live in. There's more at play there. I mean, there's certainly a dumbing down, but yeah, there is a much more narrower group of people that want that super meaty detail oriented stuff. And I mean, I have all these little sections in our YouTube videos that were like, you know, let's talk nerdy to me or, Hey, you know, we're going to you know break it down with some like really technical stuff here. And there's people that absolutely nerd out on that. And that's cool. You know, iron sharp sharpens iron, man. So it's like uh, a lot of times I might put something out there and then somebody might reply back in the comments about something that I never thought of. And it's like, I've just gained some knowledge because what I put out there, they've come back and then like gave me a whole new perspective on stuff. So that's that's really cool. And the fact that the bigger of the platform that you have, the more help you can get if you get in a jam sometimes. Because there's been a lot of times where I'm like way out of my element with some of the builds that we might have. And I'm like, I don't know anything about what this. And somebody's like, oh yeah, you need this transfer case and this transmission and this gearbox and now that, and that'll work. And then this drive shaft, you put it like this. And I'm like, that's amazing. So that's that's cool. But yeah, there's somebody somewhere that's done something and they're willing to help. So so I'm interested in terms of when you started the YouTube channel, was it sort of a, a case of, I'm going to be the next big thing. This is going to be my retirement fund and I'm going to be printing millions of dollars a, a year. Was that the direction you sort of were going? I mean, I think a, a lot of people as well on the outside don't realize how much work a successful YouTube channel is. And you kind of you alluded to the fact that if you want to feed the algorithm properly, you're going to have to be posting consistently and frequent videos. But yeah, so I'm interested at the outset, what was the mindset for YouTube? Well, again, I mean, at the time I was I was sharing a shop with Cletus and he's got, you know, millions right now and whatever. I'm not him. You know, we're different people. So he's an entertainer first and foremost. He's very good at it. That is not me. So it's like me, I'm I'm just some goofball that messes around with stuff and it's like I just try hard. You know, that's that's it. And it's like, yeah, sometimes I can be funny, sometimes I'm not, you know. So it's it is what it is. I'm much more interested in offering more than just that. You know, like if somebody comes and wants to watch a video and stuff, it's like I wanna share more than just that though and it's like hey look you know there's a lot of people that are thirsty for other things you know we're all thirsty for other things but it's like if i can get some sort of words of wisdom to somebody that's a younger me or whatever something that's going to either save them some heartache or something in their life or sometimes i would even do like some cooking stuff and i'd be like dude you guys got to try a brisket like this i'm telling you i was like amazing you know it's like i i enjoy that and sometimes people would come back and be like you know i did it that way and dude you're right you know for sure it's like I, when i say something i want people to be like no bs the dude is telling the truth and it's like i've built that for years so it's like if i say something i want it to be like dude telling the truth it's the real deal and that's that so youtube wants kind of a dumbed down thing and a lot of people just want to be entertained i mean i get that too if you've had a hard day and to de-stress you just wanted something that's going to make you laugh or or whatever and yeah i mean there's times where i might not be able to deliver that and somebody else is but it's like i want to be the meat and the potatoes other people are the dessert doing that so it's like if you want to consume dessert dude go ahead and have dessert but it's like if you want something more filling that's hopefully what i wanted to bring to the table that's it yeah, fair. And I think that that's probably a similar angle to where we go with our channel is educational. So it doesn't appeal to everyone and we, we don't try and make it appeal to everyone. It's for the tech nerds out there who, who want that nitty gritty detail, not the sort of 22 inch wheels and the shiny paint and the big turbo. It's you know what, what's actually going on behind the scenes. So, I mean, from our perspective, we kind of use YouTube to give away probably 99% of our paid content for free and then those who really do have that thirst for knowledge and want to go further, that sort of will introduce them to our platform and then maybe some of them will go and buy courses and and that's absolutely fine. From your perspective, are you finding that there's a sort of a synergy between your YouTube channel and your mechanical workshop in terms of bringing more customers through the door or is that too obscure to really track? Well, no, I mean, it's weird. It's like in some ways it was seamless because when I was doing that, like people were like, oh, you know, you didn't have nothing before this. And I'm like, no, that's not true. We were actually booked out, you know, months ahead of time. And like, we didn't need any of that 
at that point when you're doing this for 15 years, it's like you treat people right for 15 years, that goes somewhere. You know, and it still does. I mean, I still have customers that I've had for a long time, but it's a shift. You know, Instagram is, you get a lot of business from Instagram, you get a lot of business from YouTube, but at the same time, word of mouth is still, still the king. It is still the king. So yes, one can be replaced with the other, but at the same time, you know, we had plenty of business, you know, like I was saying, when I was here at my shop before YouTube, I mean, we had 20 cars in my backyard, you know, I mean, it's like, you weren't hungry for more work. Yeah, we were not, we had everything that we could handle and more and to the point where doing YouTube to further get back on track on our question here, YouTube is demanding. And in a lot of ways, YouTube is like tuning. You can beat that editing of the video and the content to death and to try and get perfection to the point where you're six, eight hours into editing a video where it's like somebody else just slapped it together in 30 minutes and all that. And it's like, yes, there's a sloppy and whatever, but they still had five and a half extra hours of screw off time with their family where I did not. So it's like, that's the error of, of that. I think that really just comes back down to the 80-20 rule. You know, you're know, you going to get 80% of the result for 20% of the effort. And once you start going beyond that 20% of the effort, it's it's only incremental small improvements that you get. And I mean, that, that goes for shooting and editing a YouTube video and just about anything else you could imagine. All right, let's move on a little bit from the YouTube side of things. And I'm, I'm interested to, to dive into your experience with tuning. Obviously, that's a, a core element that we've kind of touched on already. At the point where your dad passed away, what would you say your level of knowledge with tuning was at that point? So nice and simple for a start. Very, very infancy. And I mean, I think you know, I could still look back on stuff that I did three or four years ago and be like, I can do that better now, certainly. It's always a sharpening of a skill set for sure. And if you stay out of it for a while, I mean, it definitely... You don't lose it, but it's like, yeah, it's like mu- building muscle. You know, it's like it's you, you have to kind of get back into the you can't just fully, you know, be as sharp as you were. You got to sharpen it again a little bit. No, I think it's a perishable skill. It requires consistent practice to be good at it and fast at it. So coming from this, as you put it, infancy of, of your tuning knowledge, What was the sort of steps you took, obviously, where you are now is a long way from that. So kind of fill us in on that journey. Well, I mean, the cars have changed, technology's changed, software's changed, hardware's changed, everything has changed. So given that the world is changing, you can't help but change with it and God help you to get knowledge as you do it. I mean, like from, let's just say the LS1 to the LT1, I mean, they're... You know, I tell people oftentimes tuning an LT car, heads and cam is like four times harder than tuning an LS with heads and cam. I mean, getting the injection timing right and the fuel pressures and the cam timing, all that other junk is so much more comprehensive and time consuming. And they're just, you know, sometimes they can be pissy with the idle and, and so on and so forth. And it's just, there's all sorts of different things. And I in no way do not get humbled still <laughs> you know so i definitely still can get humbled i think that's also kept me very grounded plus my wife helps keep me grounded yeah <laughs> so, but yeah it's it's one of those things it's like you know so a lot of times i'm getting ready to go up to pennsylvania which it's, it's a thousand miles away it's a totally different area and totally different clientele and so forth but i mean i pack in you know there's times where i'll do 43 cars in like eight days and it is a grind Honestly, I'm not tuning my own horn, but it's just like if I were to look at anybody else to do that, that same thing, it's like, wow, you tuned two turbo cars, one supercharged car, this car that was a complete mechanical disaster, and then that car in one day, in a 15-hour day, I'm getting older now. <laughs> so it's like it's like, I can't do it the way that I used to be able to do it, but wow. If anybody else was to do it like that, I'd be like, man, kudos to you. That is That is tough. You know, it is really, really tough. And uh, it's a major sacrifice. I mean, it pays well, but it's like, I do this trip a couple times a year or a few times a year and uh, I enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's different, but it's like after that trip, I am so sharp mentally on tuning because I've just been through like the freaking gamut. Man. It's just like, wow, it is. It's interesting. Let's dive into that a little bit because I mean, I think probably a lot of those listening w- would sort of have this expectation that to do a good job of tuning anything is going to be a full day on the dyno. Now, the reality is that that's absolutely not the case, but I think you just mentioned 43 cars in eight days, and my basic math says that that's a a touch over five cars every day, which is a lot, even if your day stretches to 15 hours. So talk us through, like, first of all, 
what what would be your average time spent on the dyno tuning for yeah obviously it's it's hard because there's so many different combinations but let's just talk sort of rough averages yeah how long does it take you to to dial in a car i mean it depends on the car so like i mean cadillac ctsv zl1 zr1s and stuff they're all e67 processor i know that processor intimately and I, you know, oh, you're going to have like a quick drop down of, hey, I got these injectors. Oh, I got this cold air. Okay, we're running this much boost. You got these plugs. You're running E85, blah, blah. Okay, I got something close, you know. Or uh, there's, there's been times, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate, and this doesn't often happen. Sometimes that it's like somebody comes in, they got an LS car, and it's like, okay, you got to tune this in speed density, and we're doing E85 and 93. And I get the car done and tuned in like an hour and 30 minutes. Like, dude, how did that even happen? But then you get the next car in and it's got breaking up issue. And we're, changing, we're pulling plugs and checking this. No, it's an, I got the injection timing wrong. And oh my gosh, I got too much fuel pressure. We're hitting some sort of issue and it takes me four hours to do what should have been an hour and a half car. So it's like you win and lose. You know, it's like, I, I don't think I ever get too cocky because I want to keep that aground. You know, I think that I am very good at what I do. Is there better people? Yeah, maybe. And uh, I just try hard and want people to be happy with it. I think the one of the advantages with dealing with these late model vehicles with these package upgrades particularly is that you are going to have this library of files, calibrations that you've already completed, that while they they might not be perfect, they're going to be there or thereabouts as a starting point. And I mean, again, just to sort of roll back to what I was saying about our direction change with my old business towards these late model GM vehicles, although these were Australian domestic market models, not the ones you get in the US, but still LS, same, same. And we'd have the the usual upgrades, which would be headers, exhaust, cold air intake over the radiator intake, maybe a, a speed density calibration, maybe a cam if someone wanted to go wild. And with the exception of the cam, which often requires a little bit more fettling with idle control and drivability, the basic upgrades with intake headers and exhaust it would literally take us longer to bolt the car on the dyno and then take it off we're talking dyno pack hub dyno back then than it did for the calibration and if it needed more than full four wide open throttle power pulls probably something was wrong maybe the customer had delivered it with the wrong fuel in it or something so that's how easy it can be is that always the way of course not and i would say in general i sort of have a saying that i think of every five cars that came into my shop to go on the dyno maybe one or two would go on the dyno get tuned and leave with absolutely no issues and and the remainder would require some level of you know workshop sort of spanner spinning to actually get it to a point where you could tune it maybe it needed new leads new plugs or something a bit more major is is that again that, that match your experience yeah, I mean, absolutely what you, what you said is, is true there. The fact that you have a library built of stuff like that is, you know, after you've sown that much seed, it's easier to reap that kind of harvest. If you haven't sown the seed and you're new to all this, then yeah, it's going to be way harder for that average person to build a tune that fast, that efficiently and whatever. But because you have a library, yeah, certainly. That's a major asset and resource to being able to, have done it so long and it's like even if i got to craft something i have a pretty good idea i can borrow a table from here and you know steal one from there and then throw something together pretty quick i'm interested did you sort of come from standalones into this reflashing world or, or was it the other way around i was always oem processor always and then only until fairly recently did i get into standalones and the standalone you can really really appreciate for the simplification there's a whole lot in an OEM processor and, oh, and man, there's just, you can get lost in the details of, of some stuff. And then there's some things that are, you have three or four tables that are doing almost the same thing, not quite, but similar, very similar. You know, this one's versus air time. That one's cool and temp. And this one's, you know, runtime, you know, whatever it might be. But yeah, I mean, the Holly and a lot of the OEM process or a lot of standalones have brought weapons into the average person's hand. And that's a good and bad thing good and bad thing so the, i think one of the biggest things that I, irks me the most is like oh yeah i just got the self-tune on I'm like oh <laughs> <Do you? laughs> yeah so i mean that's worth actually digging into a little bit self-tune auto-tune call, call it what you want i mean that i think has been almost the clickbait of the aftermarket standalone tuning industry in terms of manufacturers selling products that on face value seem that you don't need to be a tuner to tune them 
And all power to them. I mean, yes, there's definitely some benefits in an auto-tune strategy if it works well, and, and some do a great job, others less so. But it still comes back down to understanding what you have to do in order for that auto-tune functionality to work properly. And by that I mean, you know, if you want to tune a fuel cell, you really have to drive the car so that the engine is operating central in that cell rather than interpolating between surrounding cells. The other thing is the way you drive the car is important because if you're erratic on the throttle and you're you're dropping in and out of acceleration enrichment or overrun fuel cutoff, that, that's going to mess with the, the strategy as well. So I mean it is a case of garbage in and garbage out. Do I think it's a benefit? Yeah, a- absolutely. But again, it just comes down to this knowledge of what it is and most importantly, what it is not, and then how to use it to get the best results as possible to, to do. Uh, the other element though is I've yet to see something I would consider to be truly effective in terms of auto-tuning an ignition table. Uh, that requires a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more input from the tuner rather than just setting some air fuel ratio targets and, and letting letting the ECU do all the heavy lifting. Would you agree? Absolutely. I've never dealt with an auto learning ignition table. I think the, the only point I'd say, I don't think that really exists in the consumer level. I've talked to engineers at Bosch with their 20,000 euro motorsport ECUs, which can incorporate, can incorporate in-cylinder pressure monitoring to optimize the ignition timing in that way but I mean that that's an outlier like yeah no no one listening to that pod this podcast is probably uh, up for a 20,000 euro sort of ECU so that that's not relevant to 99.9% of people so yeah what I was sort of more talking about is I have seen ECUs where they'll take knock activity and basically have a retard table that then can be applied as a long-term trim over and above the the ignition table. But I mean, there's levels to that as well. Was the knock control strategy set up properly? Has it been validated so that we know that the ECU is in fact actually detecting real knock and not some phantom knock? So again, it comes back to garbage in, garbage out, understanding the requirements of the tuner and not using these as a band-aid for doing your job properly in the first place, at, at least I believe. I just want to take a moment out of our interview with Jeremy to talk about a course that I know you're going to love if you're enjoying our interview so far, and that is our Practical Reflash Tuning course. Today in our interview with Jeremy, we've covered a lot of ground on GM reflashing, specifically on the HP Tuners platform, and we cover this in detail inside of this course, along with a lot of other material. Our Practical Reflash Tuning course is a generic course. It does not matter what reflashing platform you're using. Whether it's HP Tuners, EFI Live, Cobb, EQTech or anything else, this course will be 100% applicable. It also doesn't matter what brand of vehicle or what type of engine you're tuning. Again, 100% generic. And we know that when it comes to reflashing a vehicle for the very first time, it can be a bit daunting knowing what to do first and what order to progress in. What we've done to simplify everything is broken it down into the HPA six step tuning process. By following this process, each of the individual steps is relatively quick and easy to complete and in no time you've got to the end you've got a completely tuned engine delivering great power great torque great drivability and most importantly great reliability you're also going to have the confidence that you haven't overlooked any critical steps that could end up wasting time wasting money or even potentially damaging your expensive engine as I've said up to this point in the course learning that six step tuning process this is generic so it doesn't matter what you're actually trying trying to tune. From here we move into the second part of the course which is our library of worked examples and here we cover an informal walkthrough of that six step process. You can watch different engines and different tuning platforms being used from start to finish to cover that six step process to give you experience on a wide range of different platforms and before you ask, yes absolutely we've got a huge amount of material in there on GM using HP tuners. As an added bonus we do add to our library have worked examples from time to time once you've purchased that course you get access to any future worked examples at no additional cost so this course will continue to grow with you 
Remember, with all of our courses, there is also a 60-day no questions asked money back guarantee. So if you purchase and for any reason at all decide it's not quite what you expected or not right for you, that's fine. Let us know and we'll give you a full refund of the purchase price. We'll put a link to that course and the coupon code in the show notes to make it super easy for you to find. Let's get back to our interview with Jeremy now. Now, I just wanted to also come back one step in terms of the uh, reflashing. I mean, we teach a lot of people to tune and I would say probably the majority of people come from a standalone aftermarket ECU background, not all, but a lot. And I know there's a fear of them transitioning across to uh, OE reflashing because it's, it is quite a different world. And I mean, you open HP tuners for any GM vehicle and there's literally hundreds of, of different parameters and tables and it can seem daunting and overwhelming. The reality though is particularly if we're talking sort of a, a lightly modified vehicle and it come back to sort of those staged upgrades I was talking about, headers, exhaust, uh, maybe high flow cats, maybe a over the radiator cold air intake, there's only actually a handful of those tables we need to modify and, and deal with, correct? Yeah, I mean I do try and dive in pretty deep with that but like for the most part you don't need to get overwhelmed with the hundreds of tables that are there. It's like, yeah, you don't need to touch on all of those by any means. You don't even need to touch on half of those. And this this comes back to your 80-20 rule, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of little things that you can do with it. But again, if you have that built library and you're like, hey, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna apply, you know, I'm gonna take out this accelerator uh, limiter. I'm gonna change, say, burst knock, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set the knock retard to this, and I'm gonna take the shift point and I'm gonna cut it down to that. I mean, it's all sorts of, all of that is what it takes of what makes me who I am, you know? So it's like what somebody else might offer as a, a basic generic thing, then yeah, I wanna try and be like, hey, look, I might be charging more. I might even be charging the same. But if I speak to you and show you, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. This is what you came in with, you know, and, and you can understand, hey, look, what I am getting is better for the money, you know, and I think that most people want to have that experience. They want to feel comfortable with their investment. So, yeah. And unfortunately, I think this sort of comes back to what I was saying earlier with the tuning industry and this checkered reputation, you know, the, the number of GM vehicles that I have retuned and a customer's paid money, had it tuned elsewhere, and you take it for a drive around the block and the, it was just, it was a bag of shit basically. And you know, you look into what's actually been changed and, and maybe it's had a, a, a few more degrees of timing added in, maybe they've changed the power enrichment targets, but when you actually look at what's going on, maybe the closed loop fuel trims are, are maxed out at sort of plus or minus 25%, you know, they, they haven't actually done the fundamentals of getting the mass airflow sensor calibration dialed in correctly so that the ECU actually knows what's going on. And you know, these are the steps, if you don't take them in the right order and get those fundamentals dialed in, you're just going to be chasing your tail and, and basically baking in errors into the to the rest of the tables to try and make up for the fact that you've you've overlooked those fundamental core elements. The other aspect there is obviously the number of tables, what we need to adjust, what we need to tweak does depend on the modification. So what's going to be suitable for that basic stage one upgrade that I talked about or stage two upgrade, whatever it might be. You then add a stroker kit, forge pistons, erase the compression ratio, fit a cam, ported heads, all of that's out the window. You've changed almost every element of the mechanical setup of the engine then. Fundamentally, there's a lot more work that's going to be required in the calibration to get that one dialed in and, and running as, as well as it can. Now, in terms of the GM tuning, you've kind of gravitated towards HP tuners. There are other options on the market. EFI Life would be one that, that sticks out. What was it about HP tuners that sort of made it your go-to? Initially, it wasn't my go-to. We started, you know, early in, like, as soon as the LS stuff came out, you know, we purchased LS1 Edit. So we were, like, trying to, you know, and that was a very, very large investment at the time. And the software was certainly cumbersome. You could do stuff, but it was very, very cumbersome, not as user-friendly. Now, HP Tuners came along with a modified version of that. <laughs> and I liked EFI Live. EFI Live was my data logger at the time. Yeah, don't get me wrong with that. Like, I love EFI Live because when I was using HP or when I was using LS1 Edit, I was using EFI Live as the data logger. Well, HP Tuners, I think, kind of borrowed a lot from from both of those because the early versions of HP Tuners looked a whole lot like EFI Live and LS1 Edit. <laughs> so, um, but uh, 
they offered a better overall package. EFI Live didn't have the tuning software at the time. I mean, I remember having like some conversations with Paul Blackmore way back, man. Dude, there's, I mean, that's that's a name for the past. Freaking Craig Motes and Ken Kelly and all these guys from from HP Tuners. Like, I took something that I found was the best, most user friendly thing at the time, and and went with it. And I mean, for a little while there, I was you know sponsored by HP Tuners, so that was cool, you know, and it certainly helped with everything that was in the last couple of years. But I mean, I did use their software almost exclusively, you know, and Holly's been a fantastic uh, company to have as a sponsorship too. So it would just happen to be a natural, natural thing. I mean, they're both very user friendly. I think for the OEM stuff, HP Tuners is by far the most user friendly for OEM software. And they've got so many different platforms now. I mean, they're doing Subarus and freaking Porsche. For, yeah, when, when I first got started, it was very sort of squarely the, the GM and Ford market, but particularly in the last probably five years now, maybe a little bit longer, they've really branched out and expanded that. I mean, the problem with reflashing, if you're a, a commercial operator, you're going to find that one product is, is probably not enough to span the brands and models that you're going to need to deal with. But HP Tuners probably comes the, the closest, I would say. Important to mention here, though, that the software, while it is important, the user interface and, and how user-friendly that is, that obviously plays a part. But ultimately, tuning a, a GM controller on EFI Live versus HP Tuners it is the controller itself that really defines what we can and can't do. It's how GM wanted that controller to work that defines the parameters, the maps, et cetera, that are available. It's just HP Tuners is then defining, finding those those maps and then presenting them in a nice graphical format so that we can tweak them and, and understand them without having to get into the the sort of the binary file ourselves so you can essentially what i'm saying here is basically within reason you should be able to get comparable results on efi live or hp tuners would you say that's fair yeah that's more than fair i, I think like everyone you tend to gravitate towards one product and when you know that inside and out it's hard to justify a reason to go in a different direction so yeah i mean hp tuners it, it, it does a great job let's be honest i mean just had a few sort of find just with the the mention of holly efi as well is there a point, because I'm finding this is getting more and more grey as time goes by, is there a point where you'd consider that reflashing is no longer the best solution and going to a standalone is, is your preference? I think it depends on the application. I, I got frustrated with a couple of guys that are like, they have these okay you know, muscle cars and then this one's got an LSA and then it's got a Holly on it or whatever. I'm like, that's cool. You could run a Holly on it, but it's like an OEM processor. It's like, dude, we could bang this thing out. It's like, I could bang it out either way pretty fast or or we have a stop cam car with a supercharger and it's running a freaking you know a fitech or something like that i'm like dude it's like we could have been you know could have been done yeah i mean like we could have done this thing in like an hour and a half you know and like do you think that's a lack of education in terms of the people who own or built the car basically a choice that was driven by a lack of an understanding of better options could, could be. I mean, or this car might have had a Haltech or something like that. But it's like, Haltech's great. However, for this basic, basic, basic thing, it's like, I don't think it's even remotely using the potential why you got it. You know, it's like we could, you could do so much cooler stuff with a Haltech. That's cool. But I mean, but you're not. <laughs> yeah, it's like we could have had a $750 ECM and harness instead of this, you know, however many thousand dollar unit. So I, I don't know if somebody just gave a bad recommendation. I don't know if somebody's like, hey, this is more expensive. It must be better. I don't know. I do think that what I at least saw was, again, there were certain shops with a bit of a fear of reflashing. They just hadn't been in that, that market. They hadn't done any reflashing so they stick to what they know which is standalone and i see exactly the same you know cars which would have absolutely run perfectly on on a factory engine control module and you know instead they're running a several thousand dollar standalone plus the harness and all of the work and then the other element is that the tuning is going to take longer i think that's that's a bit that people overlook is you know when you're starting with a factory uh, engine controller it's starting with a really good calibration for that stock engine. Now, granted, as you move further and further away from the stock engine configuration, that base calibration probably becomes a little less relevant. But again, for your basic bolt-on engine, most of what we need to do can really be focused on massive airflow sensor calibration and then power enrichment, wide open throttle operating, and that's it. We don't really need to worry too much about 
idle, cruise, cold start, most of that for those basic bolt-ons will just work really, really nicely. So it's, it's actually a, a massive time saving. Would, would you agree with, with that? Yeah, I mean, there's been many times where I've said, hey, even if you get an aftermarket ECU on this, it's like I think you're going to be hard-pressed to beat the drivability of the OEM processor. That area has grayed for me a little bit. I think you could do a great job with the aftermarket processor. I think the the more racy you get, the more appropriate the aftermarket controller is. You know, when you start to use traction control or you're doing a no prep car or you're doing something like that. And I mean, like, that's been cool. I've had it in my hand in a few of those. And I mean, you know, seven second streetcar stuff is like, it's pretty cool what you can even do on a Terminator X, even with that limited amount of inputs. You can make a seven second car have traction control with the add on box. And I mean, yeah, that's a stretch, but still, it's pretty cool. But the, the crazier you get, the more inputs that you get, it's really more race oriented and stuff. But again, that's what that is geared towards. The OEM is meant to have drivability and, and meet emission standards and all this other stuff. But, and you can tweak it to the nth degree if you have a good, competent tuner to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's easy to overlook the fact that the factory controller, all the code, the firmware, the functionality is is really designed around running one specific engine as well as possible, whereas a standalone ECU is designed to basically within reason be able to run any engine pretty well so yeah i agree on the drivability front maybe it's it's again there's a it's it's not a lot of black and white here there's more shades of gray because you can absolutely get a uh, really good drivability on a on a quality ecu but my kind of line in the sand is that when you start moving more towards a motorsport specific application that's where often it can make more sense to go standalone because you get some of those motorsport functionalities that traction control as you mentioned launch control two-step data logging even which can be a little bit trickier to to, uh, address with a factory factory engine management system still doesn't mean that that's an absolute essential but that's kind of where I'd start looking at like hey maybe this is going to actually make more sense one of the other elements I wanted to talk about with the GM specific tuning is uh, speed density which is a term we hear thrown around a, a lot and in stock form, the, the GM controller actually kind of has two separate systems. It has a, it's primarily working off a mass airflow sensor, but then it has a, a speed density subsystem. Then we can apply these what are called software patches, which basically rewrite the way the processor works and gets rid of that mass airflow sensor in favour of running full-time speed density. So a bunch of stuff to unpack here. Can, can you start with maybe explaining to us why and when we would consider switching from a mass airflow sensor to speed density. I mean, a lot of people think that by doing nothing more than getting rid of the mass airflow sensor, we're going to make more power. Is that the case? In theory, I mean, if if you don't have a restrictive mass airflow, there shouldn't be a difference in power. It's just the means of controlling that power. So let's talk like an earlier LS processor, like a, you know, let's let's talk a O2 Camaro, for example. Okay. And a customer wants to make 600 wheel horsepower and he has a supercharger Okay, and 10 pounds of boost on a head cam car. Uh, yes, you could certainly tune the car in mass airflow. However, you're probably going to peg that mass airflow really close to that area. You're probably going to peg it before 600 wheel horsepower. So now you've lost your resolution. Let's just say you've ran out of mass airflow at 5,500 RPM, well, 5,500 now to to redline, which could be 6,800 or so, you have an iffy amount of fueling and you're gonna have to butcher that PE table in order to be able to make it work. So in order to, and and furthermore, it's not detecting boost. So me personally, I would like to associate a timing curve with boost so that I know how much timing it's gonna have at X boost. And that doesn't work with that. You can kind of manipulate it, but it, it would be better to go speed density at that point. And then you're no longer pegged on that, that aspect of fueling. Now you are, you're basically at 10 pounds boost. You have a portion amount of fueling and you could say at eight pounds of boost at 4,800, for example, or 5,200. Now you've got the proportion amount of fuel. So you have to go in and you have to tailor the map specifically to that amount of boost uh, all the way through. And I mean, sometimes the speed density map can take longer. Sometimes it doesn't. It just depends. Speed density map is going to go beyond, you know, atmospheric pressure. So where you're making boost and, and specifically if you're running out of mass airflow. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's also certain cold airs, for example, 
that are just not really good for certain mass areas for drivability. And it benefits you to go speed density so that you're taking away this accordion, you know, moving up airflow going through the mass airflow. Uh, certain cars, it's it's super, super beneficial to to tune both the speed density and the mass. I mean, I would always try and tune the speed density and the mass air as well, but it's just like, let's just take a C6 Z06. That car is busy with a, a large head and cam. I mean, it has the largest port, so it has very, very poor port velocity at certain engine speeds, and it's just ugly sometimes. So sometimes going to speed density with that and then also manipulating some of the O2 feedback to try and get rid of that reverberation or that surging or that you get at say 1700 to 2200 can be beneficial but i'm not trying to go down a crazy rabbit hole there but like yeah in certain applications it's better to have it for just drivability on you know a larger camped car it could be uh it just it really does depend on the application sure the couple of terms that you just mentioned that i just wanted to clear up for those who maybe aren't kind of picking up what we're putting down here so uh when you mentioned the the pegged mass airflow sensor Basically, the mass airflow sensor outputs a, a frequency to the controller based on the amount of air running through it. And there is a limit. These can't just measure an infinite amount of airflow. So at some point, if the factory airflow meter that was designed to measure X pounds per minute of airflow, and then you take uh, that engine and you supercharge it or twin turbo it, and all of a sudden you're asking for 2 or 3X the, the factory airflow, it's reasonable to understand that maybe that mass airflow sensor can't actually keep up. So basically, you peg the output. It just stays flatlined. And once you get to that flat line, that maximum output, the airflow could be anything. It could be right on that flat line limit. It could be 2% above it. It could be 20% above it. And the only way to to sort of deal with that, if you're going to try and put a Band-Aid on this thing, is to sort of fudge the PE table, the power enrichment table. Basically, the lambda or airfuel ratio targets we're requesting when we're under power enrichment or wide open throttle, correct? So that, that's the problem when you, you're out of resolution on your mass airflow sensor. I almost didn't realize how nerdy we just got with that because that is like way over the average cat's head. <laughs> but that's why I thought I'll just br- I'll just bring it back and clear these terms up. <laughs> so we can go the other direction too and factor in all these other things. But yeah, no, that that is true. So 512 grams per second. I a lot of times you know just roughly associate one gram per second to power output. So let's just say at 512 horsepower, you know, you're running out of mass here. But at that 600 horsepower figure, it's like. Yes, it needs to be able to control that proportionately. And uh, and the thing is, is that, you know, load can change on the street and load and, and then furthermore with weather. I mean, I usually find, you know, 25 degrees of air temp, you know, as far as Fahrenheit to make a pound of boost different. So maybe we're making 12 pounds of boost in 40 degree air. I mean, we go from 30s to 90s in Florida. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we have a huge swing of, of air temperature here, but at the same time, it's like speed density isn't perfect, but it will do a much better job of, of covering that discrepancy. So I think speed density has a bad rap, but people are like, oh, hey, it's, is it going to be able to cover the air temperature? And, and yes, I mean, some IT, oh, yeah, let's, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so for us to say, I mean, the difference really with mass airflow sensor is we are directly measuring the mass of air entering the engine. And that's the key input that the controller needs to know because if it accurately knows the mass of air entering the engine and it knows what size injectors are fitted to it, which is another bunch of tables, it's really easy for the controller to say, okay, I need this pulse width delivered to the injectors. I'm going to get my target air fuel ratio. And when everything's working, that's exactly how it works. So it is it is actually really nice. They're not infallible. There are definitely some some downsides and potential pitfalls with the mass airflow sensor. On the other hand, the speed density principle, instead of directly measuring the airflow, we're actually calculating it, which does open ourselves up to some potential for some errors in there. Done properly, it is absolutely accurate and and does work really, really nicely. One element, and you did mention it there, I do find that speed density tends to give a much better result drivability-wise with a really sort of aggressive cam compared to mass airflow sensors. I think just the, the reversion pulsing we get, particularly around idle. I mean, the airflow meter, one of its problems is it doesn't actually really care which way the air is flowing through it. It's just going to measure it. So if you're getting sort of reversion pulsing and the sort of the air is pulsing backwards and forwards 
across the airflow meter, it can end up measuring the same air more than once. So it can get really tricky to actually get good control of the, of the fueling under those conditions. Specifically, though, I'm just let, let's dive a little bit into to how GM do this in stock form. So I mentioned that their primary load input is that mass airflow sensor, but Actually, what I think probably a portion of tuners out there, even tuning GM vehicles, don't realise is they do actually have a speed density subsystem in GM lingo, virtual volumetric efficiency. Can, can you talk to us about how those two integrate and what that means to the tuner if you want to do a, a really good job of thoroughly tuning the engine? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the analogies that I use all the time is that, okay, if you're going to build a house, you need to have a foundation, and the, and the VE table is effectively the foundation. If the foundation isn't perfectly plumb and flat, then you're going to have some things that are off kilter with your house. Uh, that holds true with that. So it's like there can be some areas within the speed density map because again you have two tables okay and they both coexist and one is a filter of the other so even if you, like you could theoretically run this on, on just mass air by you know, disabling dynamic cylinder air so i like to have the dynamic cylinder air there for certain things but it's like basically you're taking a blend of these two tables and there's a, a percentage of what you're using for this filter and so for example if we have a cammed car yes we're going to have to cut massive amounts of fuel out of near idle. So we might even take 30 or 40% of fuel out of idle in order to get the drivability right so it's not so rich and it wants to dive down and stall and flood on its own fuel and all this other type of thing and help generate better vacuum, blah, blah, blah. That happens. So being able to get that map right first, just as you had said, and then further get the mass airflow, turn that on, and then you're tuning that correctly as well. It's more work, but it certainly yields a better result. Yeah, I, I, just to go maybe a touch further, so I mean, at least my experience and understanding of it is that the primary input is the mass airflow sensor, so that is what the ECU is using to schedule fuel and ignition timing primarily. However, under transient conditions in particular, the there can be a latency with the mass airflow sensor signal. So GM have found that momentarily switching to their speed density subsystem during transients will give more precise control for that very short period of time before then steady state is re-established and, and we switch back to, to mass airflow sensor. So yes, the mass airflow sensor is the primary input and that's used the majority of the time, but there is still this, this back and forth switching between VE, uh, virtual VE and the mass airflow sensor depending on the conditions. So I think where a lot of people go wrong is they either don't know or don't care about the sub subsystem, the VE subsystem, so they just ignore it. And that's fine, again, I keep coming back to this lightly modified sort of headers and exhaust intake. You'll probably get away with it. It's not going to be perfect, but it, it'll work. But you know, the further you move away from that base sort of setup and the more you modify the engine, that virtual volumetric efficiency subsystem is getting further and further and further away from being accurate. And that's when you're going to start to bring in these drivability potential problems and drivability. So yeah, on that note though, that's how the factory system works. The speed density system that we're talking about is the software patch where we're removing the mass airflow sensor in its entirety. And then we are presented with, for all intents and purposes, what looks like a conventional volumetric efficiency table that we need to tune albeit we're not using numbers in GM lingo sort of zero to maybe 110% are we it's GM VE which is quite a lot larger in terms of the numbers can you talk to us about how that works basically you just have to look at it as an arbitrary number and it's still just a curve so I mean yeah I mean I was doing one today and it had a value of like 4100 I don't know 12 pounds of boost or something like that and we had an idle value of somewhere maybe like, I don't know, could have been 11 or 1400 or something like that. But that's just, it's an arbitrary number. You know, it's like, yes, ultimately that converts the pulse width of the injector. And you could look at it like that. I don't know the algorithm. You know, I'm just looking at it as the flow of the map. And part of what we were talking about a little earlier was, hey, the map doesn't have to be perfectly, perfectly smooth all the way through. And I'm a huge fan of smoothing. So it's like if I'm taking out 15, 20% here near idle because I see that it's there, but yet at 2000 RPM, it's like, hey, we're, we're two, five, 
maybe 7% off here. It's like, yeah, I'm going to still pull this 5% here. I'm going to pull that 18 to 20% your idle. And I'm going to click that smoothing like two times. You know, I'm not going to click it like 27 times, but it's like if I'm early, 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 like in a, in a Holly map or even a GM map, it doesn't really matter. It's like if we're way, way, way off and I'm like, wow, we got really, really bad trims one way or the other. I'm like, we're going to add massive amounts. And then, yeah, we're going to blend it four, five, six, seven times or whatever. And then again, it's just a, it's kind of one of those experience things. It's one of those, hey, this map, obviously we're going to be consuming less fuel at idle than we are at 2000 and mid load and then 3000 and full load that still needs to be more. So all those kind of need to gel together. You need to have this map that's shaped in a certain way and understand, hey, you know, this either color or this value is down here and where your VE is greatest is where the engine's going to be generally making peak torque and, you know, things like that. You, you can kind of you know, see that works. And I mean, there's always other little things going on. Like if you have a dropping fuel pressure on the deadhead fuel system, you're going to have to add more pulse width because the fuel pressure is dropping. Yeah, I think these are a lot of things that come as you get better and more experience with tuning. So there's definitely a belief out there, and I think this comes maybe more from novice tuners, that in order for a an engine to be calibrated properly, the maps must look smooth as butter. And the reality is that I would say more often than not, that probably holds true. But there are instances where I'd say probably the, the key one would be a fairly, fairly wild cam. Uh, maybe with individual throttle bodies as well makes this a, a little bit trickier. And particularly at lower RPM at wide open throttle, you can actually see some really big jumps in the, the VE table in order to get your fueling on point. And you know, if you just presented someone with that map and said, here, rate my map, they're going to go, this is dog shit, you don't know what you're doing. But you actually put that thing on the dyno, you monitor the air fuel ratio and it's it's absolutely on point. I think the key that you just mentioned as well is that the, the volumetric efficiency table really is representing airflow and airflow is torque. So if you've got your VE table dialed in accurately, the VE table, that shape of the table should look somewhat similar to your torque curve when you're looking at your result on the dyno. And again, quite often these heavily cammed NA engines, they don't have the, the turbo or the supercharger to sort of smooth out the airflow. They will have these quite big peaks and troughs at lower RPM in the V and the torque curve. And then as we get higher in the RPM and everything sort of starts to, to work efficiently, then it smooths out and looks more like it should. So you know, if your fuel table or your VE table is looking pretty much like your torque curve, probably chances are you, you're there or thereabouts, you're in the in the, the ballpark. I guess my point from this is I, I don't try and chase perfection in terms of getting this buttery smooth map. I want to give the engine what it needs. But there's, there's of course levels to this. Coming back to your point though, that polynomial smoothing function in the HP tuners is really, really nice. But exactly as you say, using it with a bit of understanding of what it's doing and just not highlighting the entire map, clicking that 30 times and, and calling it good, you know, that, that's, that's not what it's there for. It's not, you know, it'll achieve a beautifully smooth looking map, but almost certainly not what the engine wants. Yeah, the, the area that you select is incredibly crucial. So, yeah, yeah, knowing where and where not to smooth, yeah, for sure. Moving on slightly with this topic, I'm interested to, to dive into this. We, we spoke real briefly before we started recording here, and this has been a really hot topic, so I'm, I'm keen to get your, your perspective on it. The EPA and legalities around some of the aftermarket tuning that's occurring in the US. I've had a number of people on the podcast who have either been targeted by the EPA, some have been issued pretty significant fines, others are trying to change their business model so that they get away from what they perceive as, as risk from the EPA cracking down. What What's going on? We're a little bit immune or isolated I guess from from what is happening being that we, we come from New Zealand but you know obviously it's a, it's a big topic and it's going to affect the entire worldwide tuning industry in some way shape or form depending on how far this goes. Yeah there's a bully in the schoolyard you know <laughs> and uh, I think the bully just got a little reprimand from the teacher and uh, teachers the Supreme Court Supreme Court ruled EPA versus West Virginia that, in fact, the EPA is trying to not only create legislation, but also enforce legislation that it drew out of thin air by bypassing the legal legislation that was 
creating a law and having it voted upon. So in other words, you know, that would be like me going to my neighbor and being like, hey, you know, your fence or, you know, you're growing things that you shouldn't be growing and I'm going to start penalizing you. It's kind of that simple. In fact, this is a mafia type thing going on. I mean, it's really like Supreme Court ruled, hey, you can't be enforcing this legislation that isn't even legislation. You're trying to enforce laws that are not legally laws. And most people have not even realized that. And that's such a huge ruling. And that applies for all sorts of three little letter agencies within the United States. So there's all sorts of agencies that are creating laws that are, the EPA can put something out there for 30 days in a paper and say, this is going to be this, and then it becomes law. Well, that's, that's illegal. I'm sorry. Is this, is this quite a, a recent ruling? I mean, I am, as I mentioned, a, a little bit out of the loop. I think it was a year ago, you know, fairly recent. And it's been kept under the rug because, I mean, if somebody's generating money through something like that, they want to, you know, and they just lost their revenue stream, they just lost their teeth and got neutered, they want to keep it quiet. There there are certain things I'm going to say, certain things I'm not, but there's, there's two sides to the coin, you know. They're trying to enforce stuff illegally. And if people are just going to take it, then, yeah, they're going to part with their money. And you want to be a slave, then, you know, you can be a slave. But if you're going to stand up to it, stand up to it. You have a lot more on your side than you realize. Brent from PFI, good friend of mine, truly love the guy, awesome dude. We've had some conversations and there's a lot more in your court than you realize. So to me, I uh, knowledge is the most expensive thing in the world. <laughs> and uh, I've invested a lot in knowledge lately. The stuff that I've learned makes me less fearful of you know something because of what they're trying to do is illegal and they don't have the legal means to stand on that so there's a whole lot of you know and this is this is a very very deep all-encompassing rabbit hole that we could talk for five to ten hours you know about (laughs) but but i mean it's it's very very broad and and all this stuff but i mean the fact is that if you learn more of the real law and you can exempt yourself from some of this, which you can, you shouldn't fear for it. Let's just say that. Okay. I mean, that, that's really interesting. Again, I, I haven't had the displeasure of, of these sorts of problems, and I'm very grateful for that. We've talked to plenty of uh, training shops in the US, though, who have. I guess, is there any advice you'd give to operators in the US who are worried about the EPA cracking down on their operation in terms of how best to, to go about dealing with this? Is this just a case of getting involved with a solicitor who is knowledgeable in this area? Learn the law for yourself. That is the biggest thing. And then read deep into the EPA versus West Virginia and understand the ruling of the Supreme Court saying that you cannot enforce laws that are not legislation. Okay. Sounds like some interesting reading to have a look at there. All right. One of the services that I know that you offer, which we get asked about a lot, is street tuning. You've got a Dynajet Dyno, but you also offer street tuning and you also offer remote tuning. So I'm interested in in your perspective, pros and cons of, let's say, street tuning versus tuning on a dyno, and why you would choose one method over another. Uh, That's a great question. Let's take that O2 Camaro that we were talking about. Speed density, you know, that we had tuned on the dyno, okay? We can take that same car and put it on the street, and the air fuel should be the same on the dyno as it was on the street. Okay, at least on paper, and I would say 98% of the time that's the case. When tuning speed density, it should be the same. However, let, now let's mention a car, you know, like a 2017 Z06. That car, you can dyno that car, have the air fuel ratio absolutely perfect. And dynamically, that car is different than it is statically. And then I would say these are the reasons. Okay, air temperature can be different both under the hood with the hood open versus closed for one. For two, wind resistance car can and will boost more oftentimes especially if you get into top of fourth or fifth gear in an automatic car there or fourth gear in a a manual car there's a lot more wind resistance at 130 miles an hour than there is on the dyno at a simulated 3,000 pound load especially if the car is 37 plus 100 pounds to begin with so your spark knock thresholds are going to be probably a little different but i would say half the time the air fuel ratio is different so every every single late model car that's boosted NA, usually they're the same, but boosted, the air-fuel ratio is different. So 
we do some a lot of ram air modifications and sometimes i cut the hole too big or sometimes i don't cut it big enough and it's like that now we have a totally different air fuel ratio by it could be a full point so we're talking 10 percent different air fuel ratio on the street versus on the dyno so that's why i would be like heavily encouraged check your work what you've done on the dyno if you spend all the time got all that dead nuts on the money and then you go ahead and you put it on the street you might be second gear hey it's got the same air fuel ratio third gear like well that's moving a little bit fourth gear like oh wow that's six or seven tenths of a point off and then fourth gear fifth gear whatever you're like dude we're a full point leaner or richer than what it was in the dyno so like you know you got to make some adjustments there you have to make some sort of uh you might have to be richer in this gear to make this gear where the heaviest load is it's just one of those things so street tuning is very very important i would say the lighter the vehicle and if it's naturally aspirated doesn't matter as much the heavier the vehicle and if it's boosted absolutely matters tremendously so, uh, and especially if it's got bad wind resistance, like a truck here in the States, you know, everybody and their brothers build in turbo junkyard, you know, stuff. So they're putting them in C and K series trucks that are terrible. They're bricks, you know, I mean, they're awesome to, to own and drive and, you know, whatever, but they're terrible for, uh, you know, aerodynamics. So <laughs> they can boost a lot more in, you know, top of second, third gear if it's a four speed car and if it's a six or eight speed car i mean yeah as you get up in gears they can boost a lot more than what they did on the dyno especially if they're turbo so 100 percent agree i've been a long-standing advocate of always even with a, a good quality dyno taking the car out on the street assuming that it's it's road legal once it's been on the dyno and just confirming that everything we saw on the dyno matches in the real world and as you obviously find out as well nine out of ten times there's some difference and and sometimes maybe it's it's minor and other times it's it's actually pretty significant so i mean, i think my take on that has always been that it's difficult even with a well designed engine uh, dyno cell to replicate the actual temperatures that the engine is seeing when it's at 100 miles an hour 60 miles an hour on the open road and we don't obviously drive or, or race our cars on the dyno. So, I mean, it's, it's only relevant to a point. What, what really matters is what it's doing out in the real world. And one other point I'll just add in, I don't know if this is an option with your Dynajet because I think it's an inertia dyno, so kind of it is what it is. What I always try and do is replicate real world ramp run conditions as far as I can. And what I really want to do is, is do that in the worst case scenario so how the engine's going to accelerate when it's super heavily loaded maybe fourth or fifth gear and if you've got a data log of what that's actually doing in the real world you can often match that with a load bearing dyno in terms of the ramp rate so for example if i see that an engine's accelerating in fourth gear at 500 rpm per second you know i can then replicate that ramp rate it's still not going to necessarily be perfect but it does at least give a fairly realistic amount of load on the engine so what you see on the dyno should be there or thereabouts what you're going to see on the road but again still chasing it up on the road and, and just confirming i think absolutely worthwhile i'm interested in terms of like that that makes sense to me as a confirmation of what we saw on the dyno however starting from scratch and only using the road obviously we don't get feedback in terms of torque and power numbers are you doing this style of tuning no dyno in sight only on the road if so what are you using to validate your results i mean there's software packages like virtual dyno or are you kind of getting your air fuel ratio where you know you need it to be making sure that you're at or just below the knock threshold and and that's enough to know that you're where where you should be yeah that's a very loaded question <laughs> i'll try and answer all those um yes at or below the knock threshold yes getting air fuel ratio right on the street i mean there's there's been times where I've had to just rely on a street tune. Most oftentimes I try and price it so that it's a no brainer for the customer to just get the dyno tune and we're still going to street tune any or try and point them in that direction and be like, Hey, look, if you knew what I knew, it would be so much worth it to just do this, do the dyno tuning first. It's a controlled environment. And then, you know, when we're ready and we've taken a lot of the volatility out of it because of X reason or whatever, and we've got something good and safe that we believe we can push. Yeah. Let's put it on the street and we're going to make sure that it's right and correct with experience. You're saying, hey, look, on the dyno, we were near this knock threshold here. I might even pull a degree out before we go on the street, knowing that we're going to gain some boost. Or, uh, you know, again, my dy dyno is a simulated 3,000 pound load, and there's not many 3,000 pound cars anymore. So they're all heavier. And yes, aerodynamics might have gotten better, but they are all heavier. So, how about uh, e tuning where you're 
you know, maybe the the car's not even in the US and, and you've never seen it. Uh, is that a service that you're offering? And if so, how do you go about that? That sounds potentially scary. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It can be. And I mean, there's a there's an element of risk with that. But at the same time, you know, sometimes I'll have either customers, on, you know, preferably have a wide band. Sometimes tuning without a wide band is, is even possible, not preferred. You know, sometimes some videos, you know, like I'll be like, hey, look, if you feel comfortable, can you shoot a quick little video of the car? Or I'm like trying to troubleshoot because like oftentimes vacuum leaks, people don't route the PCB systems correctly. And that's, that's a quite an often thing. So oftentimes I depend on pictures from whoever the customer is, be like, make sure that Hey, our PCB system is correct. That's one thing. There's so many things to go down for troubleshooting where I would like a picture or a video while I'm tuning or something to be like, hey, as if I'm there. So I do do a lot of mail tuning, but I do rely on a lot of pictures or videos or input and I ask a lot of questions. So try and get to the bottom of that as if I were there. I mean, I think it's become easier as factory controllers ecus have become more complex with more inputs you can see more of what's going on i mean e-tuning in a car that i never actually laid hands on if i go back 20 years not a chance in hell i'd ever consider that because i know that the results would be flawed these days with closed loop uh, not control particularly vehicles which rely on closed loop wideband air fuel ratio control you've kind of got all of the parameters that you would need to, to be able to do a good job but I mean I guess it all really depends on the situation and for a lightly modified car keep going back to our sort of headers exhaust and intake absolutely fine if you're starting to go really wild and maybe adding twin turbos massive cam all the rest of the works then i mean i have no doubt it's possible but probably at that point i would prefer to actually see the car on a dyno in front of me i don't know if, if that's your sort of stance as well yeah i wouldn't have any sort of problem again there's an element of risk you know so yeah i guess it depends on how comfortable you feel in it so all right uh, i think jeremy we'll, we'll move on towards wrapping this interview up we've uh, we've probably taken up more than enough of your time at this point and uh, we like to finish all of our podcast episodes with the same three questions we ask all of our guests the first of those is what's next in the future for you and your business well i don't know exactly what's next with that i mean i've got a <laughs> i've got a ton of project cars that i have like left over from youtube so I don't know if I'm going to sell them all. I don't know. I don't even have time to drive them all. I think I've got like 14 project cars or something like that, you know, and some of them run, some run flawlessly, some of them don't, some of them need some love. I, I don't know. Sounds like your average project car to me. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might do a little bit of stuff to get back to some YouTube, but certainly not as the trying to make that the, the main source of income. I have to look at it for promoting other things with the business. Actually here to answer your question. Yeah, I do want to try and do some tuning school stuff. I do want to offer some tips here and there online and stuff. I mean, you guys do a great job with that type of thing. Do something a little bit similar. But yeah, do some, doing some tuning school stuff. But we have plenty of work at the shop. It's neat. You know, I mean, I think we do very pleased with our overall, you know, performance. I mean, dude, it's crazy now to think about our average head and cam, like on an LT4 car, makes like 820 wheel horsepower. That is nuts. I never would have thought that. You know, and it drives so good. So good. And it's like, this is a 150 something mile an hour car in the quarter mile. And dude, it drives so good. It's like, it's incredible. Still take it, take it through the drive through on the way back from the strip. Yeah, it just, it blows my mind. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, my guys do great work. I'm really pleased with them. We just got one of our shifter carts up and running and that's a fun project. Dude. Those are, those are the best. If you can't afford to build sort of crazy project cart, get a shifter cart. You know, that is so much fun hard to beat one of those for power to weight okay sounds like more of the same pretty much which isn't necessarily a bad aim either next question uh, is there any advice you give to a younger version of yourself to help reach where you have or where you are in your career maybe a little bit faster yeah that's, that's a that's a great question and um i don't know i think maybe 10 or so plus years ago i would have worked myself too hard and, and cut too much of my family time whereas no one is ever going to be in their deathbed wishing that they worked more, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, spend more time with your family, but at the same time, you know, all things in moderation. Yeah, that sounds sounds perfectly reasonable. I, and I think in terms of tr trying to find that work-life balance, that, that's always a challenge for, for anyone starting a, a business. And 
there's no right answer here. I mean, the, the solution has to be suited to the individual, but it does change the dynamic a lot when you start to have a young family. And um, the, the kids grow up very quickly and you don't get that time back. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't have all of the answers there. I don't know if I've got it right myself, but certainly something to keep uh, front of mind anyway. All right, our last question for today, Jeremy, if people want to follow you and see what you're up to, how are they best to do so? Um, they can always catch up on some Faster Problems videos on YouTube. Uh, Instagram is something, and I mean, people DM me on Instagram or just email. I mean, Jeremy at FasterProms.net. You know, I mean, people want to ask me questions about stuff. I can't answer everything by any means. And, and some emails I don't even look at for months. You know, I might even check a certain account for a month. But nonetheless, I do post some stuff on Instagram. I've been laying low fairly recently for you know, a couple months and stuff. I've just burned out on social media. And all, all in all, what I want to do is I want to be, you know, like I said, I want to offer a little bit more than just the tuning knowledge. There's other wisdoms behind there. By no means do I have all the answers, but if there's something that I can help somebody, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Perfect. Well, as usual, we'll put links to your accounts in the show notes to make it super easy for people to find. Look, it's been a really interesting chat, a little deeper on the uh, the GM tuning side than we've had the opportunity to go before, which I think is probably, well, hopefully going to benefit a, a bunch of people out there. But really interesting chat, Jeremy, and uh, thank you for sharing your story with us and taking the time to chat. Well, thank you very much for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Jeremy, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. This is also a great place to ask any questions you might have too and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week a big shout out to Nebia from the United Kingdom who has said absolutely incredible. These episodes will bring you top notch knowledge about all aspects of cars and the motorsport industry. Never a boring chat. Don't miss out on your weekly dose. Well, thanks for the kind words there, Nebia. Great that you are enjoying the podcast. And if you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details, we'll fire a fresh tea straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember you've got that coupon code, you can use podcast75 at the checkout to get $75 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires, you can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum, which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.